Thank you, Seth, and good morning, and that's a uh, good introduction to our text this morning. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 17, which I titled Nonconformists, Peter writes, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Now, I'm going to speak about that word visitation in the, the sermon itself, but some of you may have a note in the side, in the margin, and it uh, ad- uh, defines that as Christ's coming again in judgment. That's a possibility. I don't take it that way. I take it as a day of salvation, but uh, we'll talk about that when we come to it. He continues, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as, a bond, as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the King. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Growing up in a Christian home, I would sometimes hear, remember, you're to be in the world, but not of the world. Usually, as I was going out on a Saturday night, (laughs) it was a good reminder from concerned parents. I didn't hear it often, but I heard it often enough that you might have thought it was a verse of Scripture. It isn't. But it is scriptural. In John chapter 17, verse 15, Jesus prayed, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. And Paul told the Romans in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. In the world, but not of the world. That's Peter's counsel in our text in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 17. In fact, it's his counsel in virtually the rest of the book. Verse 11 begins what has been called structurally the second half of the letter. The first part has most of the theology. The rest of the book is applying the theology. The saints have been chosen by the Father, ransomed by the Son, sanctified, set apart by the Holy Spirit. So, by the grace of God, we are fundamentally different from what we once were. Therefore, we are to live like it. In chapter 1, verse 15, Peter wrote, Be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Now in the rest of the letter, the saints of Asia Minor are given instruction by Peter on their behavior, on how they are to practice holiness in the world. Borrowing from Paul's statement in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, we are to be nonconformists. Now that's a loaded term, especially in our day. We, we often equate nonconformists with rebels or with eccentrics, oddballs. I never wanted to be that. Just the opposite. I grew up wanting to conform, to, to fit in like everyone else. Uh, oh, those are nice shoes. He's wearing them too. 
So is he. I want some. That's a nice shirt. He's got one too. I want one. I like to conform, but that's the struggle, isn't it? We can't be like everyone else. Because we aren't. And Peter began his lesson here with that reminder. He told them who they are. Aliens and strangers. He began the book that way. To those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia who are chosen. In other words, not of the world. Not any longer. So he counseled them to be different. To abstain from fleshly lusts. He did that with, with, with a sense of urgency and affection. He showed his affection like that of a concerned parent watching a son or daughter go out the door on a Saturday night. Showed it by calling them beloved. That word beloved sounds a little archaic, at least to some. So in the New International Version, that is translated dear friends. But that, uh, at least to my mind, loses the intensity of the word. It's from the word agape. They were greatly loved by the apostle. They lived in a dangerous world that, that not only is hostile toward them, but is alluring. A world that's seductive. And he cared for them. He, he loved them as his own brothers and sisters. He loved them as a spiritual father and them as his children. Often, of course, younger brothers and sisters and sons and daughters don't want advice. But often, the young are naive. Not stupid, but inexperienced, incredulous, trusting. They need instruction. Now, I don't know that these saints were naive. As Peter just reminded them in verse 9, they had been called out of darkness and into God's marvelous light, and they knew that. Nevertheless, the, the darkness has some charm. A and old habits still tug at us. I don't think we're ever invulnerable to the world and its appeal. Never forget. Never forget. We are just dust. We are weak in and of ourselves. Peter knew all of this to be true, and so he didn't just give them advice, didn't just give them wise counsel, he earnestly urged them to heed his warning and follow his advice. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against you. All of this is very strong language. Urge has the, the idea of strongly urge. The King James Version has, Dearly beloved, I beseech you. That may sound old-fashioned, but that's the idea. I beg you. So Peter be begins by reminding them of who they are. They were not part of this place anymore. They were strangers and aliens. Christians are a new creation and don't belong to this world. And as, John's, as John told his readers in 1 John chapter 2, verse 17, the world is passing away and also its lusts. It's not permanent. It's fading even as we speak. It's a mirage. It's a lie. That means it's a bad investment. But its appeal to us is that it's not a mirage. That it's the real thing and, and it's permanent and it's really the only thing worth investing for, uh, living for and investing in. And again, that has a visceral appeal to us. Peter indicates that in the statement that it is fleshly lusts which wage war against you. War. That's not too strong a term. 
It's right out of, ex, uh, out, of, out of Ephesians chapter 6 and Paul's description of the spiritual warfare. The war is fought on three fronts. The world, the flesh, and the devil. And the devil, Satan, the master of deception, is behind it, all of it, and not one of us is sufficient against his guile. And Peter knew that well. Peter knew that better than anyone. Jesus warned him the night that he was betrayed and arrested when Peter had vowed to be loyal to him. Simon, Simon, Satan, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. And you know he did. So Peter knew the strength of the evil one. The persuasive power of his temptations and the natural appeal of fleshly lusts. So as, as an experienced saint, he urged them to beware. And again, he begins reminding them of who they are. Strangers and aliens. That's where we begin. Who are you? Chosen? Called? Priests? Sons and daughters of God, if you have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. So live like it. The expression strangers and aliens goes back to Abraham in Genesis chapter 23, verse 4, where he used it of himself. Sarah had died, and to bury her, he went to the sons of Heth to buy a plot of land for a tomb. He told them, I am a stranger and sojourner among you. Now they might have understood that in a material temporal sense. He's a Semite, a man from Ur living among the Canaanites. But Abraham lived as a spiritual stranger among them. He lived unto God and not for the world. The only land he owned was the, that grave that he bought. The only home he owned was a tent. He never built a house or a city. What a contrast that is to Cain. After murdering his brother, God sent him east of Eden to be a, va a vagrant. And what did he do? Instead of wandering, he built a city. Because that is, as a, as a it was a testimony to where his hope lay, where he had planted his hope, is in this world. Not Abraham. The only things he ever built were altars. He was a stranger and sojourner. In Hebrews 11, verse 9, Abraham is called an alien in the land of promise in Canaan, where he lived as a foreigner. It was, it was his land that God had promised to him. But in this life, he lived as a foreigner in it. For, the author wrote, he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. That's the life of faith. He believed the promise of God to him, and he lived for the future. And Peter was reminding the saints then, and us now, that that is how we are to live. Now, I don't mean that we're not to build houses, and I don't mean that we're not to have savings accounts, and I don't mean that we don't engage in life with the world. We do. In fact, Peter has much to say about that. But we are to live in this world as one living in a foreign land. We will inherit the earth. But in the present, we are pilgrims in this world. This is not our permanent home. We are passing through. In fact, the reality is everyone's just passing through. No one's here permanently. But we have that great hope before us. And we're to set our eyes on that as Abraham did. We're to be good earthly citizens. As I said, Peter emphasizes that in, in the next verses. But our true citizenship is in heaven and our destiny is the kingdom to come. That is our hope. It is a great comfort. It was to the saints who received this letter. 
They were being persecuted. They were being abused. They were being robbed. There is a better land and a better life to come, and that was a certainty to them, and it is to us. But that hope and blessing has responsibilities. Because they are aliens in this world, they were to behave like it. They were to abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against the soul. The lusts mentioned here are listed in such passages as Galatians 5, verses 19 through 25, and 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. They are the vices of paganism, part of the culture they lived in, part of the culture that we live in. They were not to conform to it. Peter had already warned them against being conformed to that way of life back in chapter 1, verse 14. But he, he came back to it because it was a problem. It needed to be addressed further. It was a great temptation, just as it, it is for us. We live in modern times. 2,000 years later, in a, a, a different place, in a different culture. But human nature hasn't changed. We face the same struggles. And again, they are struggles. It is war on our soul. And that's where the battlefield is. It is within. It is in the, the non-material part of us. Temptation affects the mind. It works on the intellect. And, and what we think about affects our being. Who we are and what we do. Good things for good, bad things for bad. Oscar Wilde said, the only way to get rid of temptation is to yield to it. Well, he was being humorous, but just the opposite is true. Yielding weakens us. Yielding strengthens desire and diminishes our witness. Peter's counsel is the opposite. Don't yield. Abstain. Then he adds the, the positive side to his exhortation in verse 12. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. Some of you are old enough to remember 1968 and the Democratic Convention in Chicago, which was not as tame as the one that ended last week. It eventually became a riot in the streets. Police with billy clubs against students who resisted. It was, a, a, it was covered on the national, by the national media on television. I can remember watching all the scenes. Some of you do too. But th through the week, the rioters chanted this statement. The whole world is watching. The whole world is watching. And what it watched was revolution and chaos. The world is always watching. It's watching us. Watching the church. And what does it see? Lawlessness? It should see excellence. It should see righteousness. It should see behavior that is in conformity with what Peter is saying. Righteous behavior. That's what Peter exhorts. They're watching. What do they see? They should see godliness in us. And he explains why they should uh, behave that way uh, correctly in the world. Why they should behave well. So that in the things in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of the visitation. Our behavior is a witness. And it can have an influence in the conversion of unbelievers. This expression, the day of visitation, can refer to the Lord visiting wrath at His coming, and it may, the term may refer to the last judgment. But it also means the Lord's visit for deliverance, for salvation. 
For example, in Genesis chapter 50, verses 24 and 25, when Joseph, Joseph was on his deathbed, he reminded his family of the promise of the exodus to come. He said, God will surely take care of you. And that literally is, will visit you. And here, visiting for salvation fits the meaning of the text. Unbelievers who are slandering Christians will glorify God when converted due to the saints' good behavior. People are converted because God grants repentance. That's Acts chapter 5, verse 31, and Acts chapter 11, verse 18. The church rejoices because they see that God's given repentance to the Gentiles, given it to them. It's a gift. Peter told the Sanhedrin that Jesus is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as prince and savior to grant repentance, give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. It is a gift of God, his sovereign grace. But God uses means to do that. He always uses the spoken word. He always uses the gospel. Salvation, faith, repentance come through hearing the word of God, hearing the clear presentation of the gospel to us. The good news of, of, of Christ's death, saving death for sinners. But he also uses soul winning behavior. It testifies to the reality of our message. That kind of behavior is seen in our response to human institutions. And in verse 13, Paul urged submission to them. That's the, the subject of the next section of the book. Verse 13, submit yourselves to the Lord's, submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as to one in as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him. Now we we are to conform. We're to conform to God's will, not conform to the standard and the spirit of the age. What we do is what we are to do, I should say, is to obey the law pretty simple. Be obedient to the law of the land. Obedience is implied in submitting or being subject to. An example of, of that is seen in Christ, who as a boy growing up is described in Luke chapter 2 verse 51 as being in subjection to his parents. He obeyed and respected them. And here the idea is that we are to obey the human authorities over us unless they command us to disobey the Lord. Peter wrote of every human institution and gave as his example human government. But his meaning is broader than that. Later he will apply this to marriage. So this is a broad principle. It, it uh, applies to all kinds of human institutions, to government, to business, and family. Christians are to recognize and honor the authority over them. We can apply this principle to the church. There is a structure of authority in the church. Christ is the head of the church. Later in chapter 5, Peter instructs elders to uh, shepherd the sheep, but he calls Christ the chief shepherd. He is the head of the church. Elders function under his authority, and what that requires of them is a lot of prayer and biblical thinking and seeking the face of the Lord and waiting upon him. Now, sometimes elders don't get it right. That calls for patience among the saints, not rebellion, and lots of prayer for the church leadership. 
The author of Hebrews has something to say about that toward the end of the letter. Uh, chapter 13, verse 17, where he counsels, uh, gives counsel on those very lines. He wrote, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. The elders give an account for their conduct, their behavior, their decisions. That, that makes that a very weighty responsibility. And so elders, one, need to know that. Often it's a, it's a daunting task. So the author concludes, let them do this with joy and not grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. It's a tough job, so give support to your elders, your shepherds, with prayer, even wise counsel when necessary. A good elder will receive wise counsel from the sheep. The principle here is broad. It occupies much of the rest of the book. But Peter's instruction here has to do with, in this text, secular institutions, and specifically human government, to a king. He wrote. Now, historical context is important here. Peter wrote this when Nero was emperor of the Roman Empire. Nero was the first emperor to persecute the church and according to tradition was responsible for Peter's death. That's a tradition, it's not a certainty. Certainly the one responsible for the death of the Apostle Paul. So God requires that we be good citizens even when the leaders are bad. But again, that does not mean that, that we are to obey bad laws. It doesn't mean that we are to conform to what is evil. Laws that contradict God's Word. The Bible gives examples of people disobeying governments with God's approval. In Exodus chapter 1, the Egyptian midwives feared God. And because they feared God, they disobeyed Pharaoh's decree to put to death all the newborn Hebrew boys. In response, God blessed their households. He established their households. In the first chapter of the book of Daniel, Daniel and his three friends, when just youths, just teenagers, refused to eat the king's food, it wasn't kosher. God blessed their health and he prospered them. In Daniel chapter 4, his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, refused to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's colossal statue, and the Lord saved them out of the fiery furnace. And both Peter and John in Acts chapter 4 disobeyed the Sanhedrin, the, the Jewish high court, and by, uh, who had decreed that they should not preach the gospel. And they, they wouldn't stop preaching it. And they continued in chapter 5, they're arrested and they're beaten. And they leave rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for the sake of the Lord and for His name's sake. Now, these are exceptions to the rule. Peter's instruction here is to be obedient to the governing authorities. And his theological basis for doing that is given in the words, for the Lord's sake. We are to live in such a way as to glorify Christ in our behavior. In verse 14, Peter continues with instruction on government. He refers to governors, men like Pilate and Felix and Festus, who, gave, who, had, who had that title. They, ha they have a necessary function, one that, that serves the common good. They are sent by him, that is, sent by the king, for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. Law keepers. That's an important reason for obedience to the institution of government and, and courts and the, its arm, the police, 
They punish the lawless and protect the lawful. This was Paul's view of government in Romans chapter 13, verse 4. It, it does not bear the sword for nothing, he wrote. It is a minister of God, an avenger who, who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. No society can function without government, which includes the police, the arm of government, the enforcer of the laws of government. Defunding the police is not only foolish, it is ungodly. When government falls, law and order end, and there's anarchy. A breakdown in society. And that's a nightmare. No one is safe. And it's happened. It's happened throughout history. It was at a time like that that a young Napoleon stepped onto the stage of history, so to speak, when he put down a Parisian mob that was storming the palace. He turned the cannons on them, gave them a taste of grape shot, as he famously said, dispersed the crowd, saved the government, which then made him general of the armies. And the rest is history. But the best situation is a stable government, a good government to ensure peace and safety and prosperity. Human government is never perfect but it is a necessary gift of God in a fallen world. And the church contributes to that by being law -abiding, a law-abiding society within society. That, that serves the general good by, for example, obeying the speed limit and stopping at red lights. I, I don't think I go out on the road without seeing someone run a red light. I, I saw it twice yesterday. One car starts into the intersection with the yellow light. By the time it's through it, it's already red. And another car comes whipping through that intersection against a red light. It's dangerous out there. We're not to contribute to that. We're to be law-abiding. But the more important reason for obedience, as important as that is, Beyond, blessing, beyond the blessing provided by the, the general welfare, as we've been talking about, the greater blessing, or the greater reason for that, is in verse 15. For such is the will of God, that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. First of all, it is God's will. That alone is reason to be a good citizen. God commands it. But the rationale for that is a good example silences critics. Obedience is, an, is a, a, a powerful apologetic for the faith. None of this is easy. Peter knew that. And... Because he knew that many might think his instruction on submission was restrictive, he connects obedience to freedom. True freedom is consistent with submission to, obedience to, God's will. The freedom he referred to is freedom from bondage to sin and from Satan and from fleshly desires. That freedom can never be a pretext for sin. Sin is the opposite of freedom. Sin is slavery. Christ said that in John 8, verse 34. I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Freedom doesn't involve sin. We're not free to sin. Freedom is not liberty to do wrong, but always to do right. And as new creatures in Christ indwelt with the Holy Spirit, in possession of the Word of God, we have the ability to do that. We have supernatural ability within us to do that, to be obedient. To be submissive to the Lord and live a life of real freedom. And specifically here, 
it is to it has to do with obeying the authorities. In verse 17, Peter sums up our social duties in four commands. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Now the first is, is a general statement. We, we are to honor all people. Christians are to treat even pagans with respect. Treat unbelievers with respect. We are to recognize all people as God's creation and value them. But we have a, a higher obligation to fellow believers. We are not only to respect them, honor them, but love them. We are to sacrifice ourselves for them. There are quotes that I give, and I know I give them often, but they're always good quotes, so I give them. <laughs> but there's that quote by Tertullian, at least it's attributed to him, one of the early church fathers, who commented on the pagans and what they saw and what they would say. They saw the church and they said, see how they love one another. And as I recall, that statement goes on to say, they are ready to, to die for one another while we kill one another. They saw the difference. It made a difference for them. It was a great witness to the world, to the pagans. The next were to fear God. That's our highest obligation. Christians are, are not only to honor God, the triune God, we are to fear Him, hold Him in awe, and live serious lives, not wanting to offend Him. We're to love the Lord. I think I've told you this before. My, my prayer, most every night, is for this congregation. And my prayer is simple. Lord, pour out your Spirit on us. Give your people a love for your Word, and through that, a love for you, and because of that, a love for one another. And may we be a welcoming and warming, a warm congregation. That, that, that's what we're to be. That's the kind of people we're to be. And we have to be together to do that. But we're to love one another. And through loving one another, we love the Lord. And vice versa. We're to love His Word. To love Him and to love each other. May God give us the grace to do that. Well, lastly, we're to honor the King. Now, this is the same word honor that's used of our treatment of all men, which may be intended to, to convey more than our treatment of the king, but also our attitude toward the king. Roman emperors claimed divinity for themselves. Peter may be implying here that they are only men, and our attitude toward them should be the same as it is toward any human. Only God is sovereign. Only God is to be worshipped. That's Daniel chapter 2, verse 21. He removes kings and He establishes kings. They come and they go according to His will. We are to fear Him and we will live well. We will live rightly. Though not without opposition. The... the, the the more we live righteously, very often, the more we'll have opposition. Generation after Peter wrote this letter to the saints in Bithynia, persecution again occurred there. The faith spread from the cities to the villages. Pagan society was being affected. It was being shaken. The temples were abandoned. Animals for sacrifice weren't sold. The, so the slander spread about Christians practicing immorality and cannibalism in their meetings. 
They celebrated the love feast, and that was taken as the worst kind of immorality, and the Lord's Supper, which they said was cannibalism, eating his flesh, drinking his blood. The governor, Pliny, wanted to stop the spread of the gospel and the church, and so he wrote the emperor for advice. Trajan counseled restraint, and Pliny discovered the truth about the Christian meetings, that they were places of modest worship. Every Sunday at sunrise, they gathered to sing responsively a song to Christ as being God, and pledged themselves by an oath not to do evil, to commit no theft or adultery, and not break their word. In other words, fear God and be good citizens. And when he learned that, the persecution stopped. When the church is not conformed to the world, but giving the gospel and living the gospel, it has an influence on the world. That may cause opposition, as I said. It will. Our defense is truth and godliness. And that will win the day. And it will win souls. We can do it by the grace of God. What about your soul? Apart from faith in Christ as your God and Savior, it's lost. You're lost and in darkness. God calls the lost out of darkness. His message is you are guilty of sin. We all are. But that guilt is removed by Christ's sacrifice, His death in our place that paid the debt in full. His sacrifice gained forgiveness for all who trust in Him. Respond to that. Come out of the darkness and into the light. Trust in Christ and His sacrifice. May God help you to do that. May God fill us with gratitude for what He's done for us. So let's stand and sing with gratitude. Number seven in the Songs of Praise book, Be Thou My Vision. Number seven. Well, Father, we do pray that You will always be our spiritual vision. May we see our great triune God in all of Your glory, all of Your grace. God that saved the lost. Infinite God that cared for such as us. It's an amazing thought. We'll ponder that for all eternity and never come to the end of the mystery and the amazement of it. We thank You for that, Father. So may that vision of you fill our hearts of a father who chose a people from the foundation of the earth who are totally unworthy, of a son who came and died for them and redeemed them, and a spirit who drew them to you. It's all of grace, and we give you thanks for that. That's the vision we need to hold on to. So bless us, Lord. Bless us this week. May we keep that vision before us. And may we live the kind of life that Peter sets forth here. A life of good behavior. It's not an option for us. It's the way God's people behave. Enable us to do that. Help us to see the importance of it and and strengthen our resolve to do that. To live to your glory. We pray these things in Christ's name. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance on you and give you peace. Amen.